here. Welcome. Uh, so last day we finished off and I said, oh, try, see what you can do with this proof. Uh, and then we'll work through it today. So uh, that's where we're gonna start, but I just wanna do a quick refresher. Um, so I'll call it review, I guess. Um, let me just change the setup here a little bit so I can see a little bit better. Okay, good. So in terms of review, uh, just kind of the short version is that um, P, so as in the P of A is usually how we denote it generically, uh, P is a probability set function, set function if, if, first of all, if the probability of A, so some set A is greater than or equal to zero. And we added, and I'm, so I'm gonna put it in brackets here, that that's of course for all A that are elements of this fancy B, where B was the set of all possible subsets in the sample space, right? So you'd have to go back and, and review that if that doesn't, sound familiar, right? But for right now, I just wanna focus on, okay, the probability of A has to be greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero, if P is a probability set function, okay? Um, second fact to remember is that the probability of the sample space has to be one, right? The probability of one of all possible things happening is one or 100%. Right, and the last thing which we ended up using a lot is that, uh, and I wanna just do um, uh, just a brief version of it, right? And so this is kind of the simplified version with only two sets. Okay, so it says that um, the set A, uh, I'll say as long as A and B is the empty set, which means they're uh, pairwise disjoint, right? A and B are pairwise disjoint. Right? Then the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B. Now you might remember the version that we first introduced, and that's the technical version that we should be using, was a lot more complicated, right? It had uh, the set of A's. So if I go back there, let's see if I can find it. It would have been pretty early on here. So this is technically what we should be saying, right? If the set of some A's, is a sequence of events in the subset of, uh, or in the group of all possible subsets of the sample space, yikes, that's B, right? And the A, M and A, N are pairwise disjoint, right? Then the probability of these unions, and they can keep going and going, not just talking about two here, but talking about uh, potentially an infinite set of unions is the sum of their individual probabilities, right? Assuming that there's no overlap. So this one, this is the technical definition, right? But I just wanted to give you a shorthand version to start us off today, okay? So that's kind of the, the simplest version. Okay, 
So we use these facts to develop some, uh, some other probability rules. Okay. So what we were going to do was, and I'll end the review there, was that we were going to, and I'll just steal it from the bottom here. We were going to try to prove theorem 1.3.3. So this is from last day. And I even said, try the proof on your own for next day, just to try it out, right? See how it goes. Um, one thing to remember about proofs is that just because they look uh, so easy and simplified when you read them, right? Or maybe not, but typically when I read a proof, I, I go, oh yeah, but how was I supposed to know that's where I was gonna start, right? And so uh, the more proofs you read, where to start is gonna become more and more obvious, right? Uh, and I don't mean like obvious every time, right? But you have some kind of typical starting points up your sleeve, okay? So that's gonna come with the more proofs that you do, uh, the, the better you'll be at saying, oh, I'm gonna try this first, right? Remember, people have spent uh, years upon years developing these proofs. No one sat down and said, oh, well, I just do this and this and this. No, um, right? Just because these are the proofs that we accept as true, uh, they took a long time to develop, right? And so when you're working on a proof, so when I ask you to try this proof on your own, I'm not expecting you to land on the right proof right away, right? You might have to try a couple of different avenues before you land on something that you feel makes sense, right? And is uh, strong enough, right? a strong enough argument. Okay. So, um, where, uh, um, yeah, so right now uh, I got a direct message, but I think it's something everyone's wondering. Uh, can we expect these proofs in assignments or exams, or are we just going to use them um, for understanding? These proofs I'm just developing so that you have an overall understanding. Um, if there is a proof that I'm going to get you to do under pressure, right? So on a test or on an assignment or whatever, um, then you'll be prepared for that. And they would be like small, small proofs. Um, but nothing, nothing big like this one. Yeah. This one that we're about to do. Uh, okay. So what we're trying to prove is that if A and B are events such that A is a subset of B, then the probability of A is less than or equal to the probability of B. When would it be equal to the probability of B? Well, it would be if all elements of A are all the elements in B, right? So if A is equal to B, then the probability of A equals the probability of B. So where can we start here? I have A is a subset of B and we kind of, we drew it out here where A is kind of inside the set of B. Okay. So what I would want to do initially, and this is just me kind of testing the waters to see uh, what's gonna work, right? But one thing that we have been doing is that what if we uh, rewrite, right? A and B or some sets as pairwise disjoint, then we can rewrite A or B uh, as the probability of A plus the probability of B, right? And I don't mean that A is going to be A from this one and B is going to be B from this one. This uh, A or B from the, the definition is just, they're just placeholders for two different sets, okay? So I think I was using dark green for the proof. Okay. So 
we can rewrite B as a set of uh, pairwise or as a union of pairwise disjoint sets. We can rewrite B as a union of pairwise disjoint sets. All right. So if I think about B, and we also know that, okay, so if I let B be this circle, I also know that A is some subset of B, then what I can do is I can say that B, well, B is gonna be A, right? So B is gonna be, oops. A or, remember, I want to write it as a union, so or, or what? So that's just a portion of B, so now I want to try to capture everything on the outside here, right? So now this area would be the area where it's not A, Right, because that's already been taken care of. So not A and in B, right? So that's gonna take some practice, right? Not A and B. This is the blue area and this is the orange area. Notice that there's no overlap here, right? So notice, Notice A and A not and B is the empty set. Nice. Um, okay. So uh, this is kind of typically how you would start it, but it's possible that you had a slightly different proof, uh, which we could look at after class if you want to, but. Uh, this is a kind of the easiest way to get there, but you could you could play around with it. Um, so because we have these uh, disjoint uh, unions, right? Then we can write. So therefore, hopefully you guys are okay with this. Therefore, it's just three dots in a triangle and it's shorthand for therefore. Therefore, and I use that a lot, of course. Therefore, the probability of A, oh, sorry, the probability of B, because B is uh, A with the union. Oh, <laughs> you'd been missing the therefore sign, I know. Right, uh, it does because it's it's like a natural follow up to okay, so this this and this therefore this, um, nice, um, so therefore we can write right by this definition here, right? If the probability of A or B, we can rewrite it as the probability of A, which is going to map to, to the probability of A in this case, but B in this case is not A and B, right? So it could be a more complicated set than just B. They're just placeholders. So the probability of B is the probability of A plus the probability of not A and B. Nice. So as long as you kind of got there, that's good. So now what I want to do is I just want to copy this so we can talk about it down here maybe, just so it's not so crammed. I'll just pull it down. So now the probability each of these probabilities 
as a fact have to be greater than zero, right? Because they're all probability functions. And so all of these have to be greater than zero. And that's from this first uh, definition, right? That for any set, uh, the probability, if you have a probability set function, the probability has to be greater than zero. So what that means is that we've got, um, this is greater than or equal to zero, this is greater than or equal to zero, and this is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so just as a fact. <clears throat> um, which means that the probability of B which is the probability of A plus the probability of not A and B, right, has to be greater than or equal to the probability of A, right? Because here we've got the probability of A plus something larger than zero, right? Greater than or equal to zero, but that's, that's allowed here, okay? And so then we can say that the probability of B is greater than or equal to the probability of A, which is where we wanted to get to, right? And so, uh, or rewriting, we find that the probability of A is less than or equal to the probability of B, right? So we use this, uh, this setup as the go-between but because the probability of A plus something is larger than the probability of A, then it follows, um, then this follows, right? Good. That's the end of that one, okay? So notice that the key is rewriting these sets um, as disjoint sets. Right, and then we can leverage. Uh, <laughs> I know when you when you get a proof, it feels so good. It's amazing, um, right? And so that's why I want you to try it. Uh, but don't be don't be upset if it's not working right away. Okay, so uh, good. How about how about another one? And these, again, are just things that we know already, right? Uh, hey, only twice? That's really fast. Um, yeah, uh, there have been proofs. So I, of course, in school, I was taking like proof courses where all you do is proofs. Uh, and there were proofs that I spent days trying to crack. It's impossible, right? You're trying to get all your puzzle pieces. It's fun, but it's exhausting. Um, so anyways, how about for this one? This one is a little bit more, <laughs> yeah, trigonometry, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, this one's a little bit more obvious but it's nice to have, uh, have it in our back pocket. So for each, for each A, so for each set in the element of all possible subsets, and that was supposed to be a fancy B, there we go. Um, then the probability of A is less than or equal to one, but greater than or equal to zero. Right, we actually already have this portion established, the fact that the probability of A has to be greater than or equal to zero. And we use that up here, right? And so we've already got that portion established, but then uh, we wanna talk about, okay, it's actually restricted to being less than one as well, right? And you've probably used that already in a previous stats course, so stat 230, you would have had to remember that, okay, a probability can only be between zero and one, right? But here's why that is. So let's see here. Um, 
our proof. I've got a, a page break here, so I'm going to try to keep it on uh, on one page. We'll see how I do. So A is an element of B, which is the set of uh, all possible subsets, right? So uh, going from the smallest possible version to the largest possible version, right? That would be going from the empty set to the sample space, right? And so, um, since A is a subset of the sample space and the empty set is uh, a subset of A, right? So I read these little subsets as contained in. So the empty set is contained in A and A is contained in the sample space, which is all possible outcomes, which is the largest possible subset available in B, right? And so kind of from smallest to largest here, A is somewhere in between. We know that, uh, and maybe I should say from the previous theorem, right? That if a is contained in the sample space, for example, if we focus on just A is contained in the sample space, then we said that the probability of A is less than or equal to the probability of the sample space, right? And we know the probability of the sample space, it, it's one. So that's where we're gonna get that one from. Uh, so then we know that the probability of the empty set is less than or equal to the probability of A, kind of chaining the things together, which is less than or equal to the probability of the sample space. So now, remember the probability of the empty set, we have proved uh, or proven that the probability of the empty set is zero, right? And we proved that last day. And so now we're allowed to use it so zero is less than or equal to the probability of A, which is less than or equal to one. And there you have it, folks. <clears throat> okay, good. All these things, hopefully kind of ringing a bell from, from stat 230 or whatever stats course you took. Um, so then the next part is not gonna come as a surprise, right? We don't always have disjoint sets, right? We could have some overlap and what do we have to do? We have to subtract one of those overlaps so that we can have uh, just a kind of a, I think of it as a flat space, right? And so if you have two sets with overlap, then to find the probability of A or B, then I have to subtract the overlap once, right, in order to find that probability. So now we're gonna establish why that is, but also uh, how that is. So, so far, we have leveraged the fact, hey, there's a fly in here, and it's been in here for days, and it just won't leave me alone. It wants to learn stats so bad. Uh, so far, we've leveraged the fact that the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B if A and B are disjoint. So now consider uh, any two events. So we're going to focus on just two events, right? But any two events, A and B. Hmm. 
So where we want to start here is just establishing, uh, it's called the general addition rule. And so here we go. So theorem, oops, theorem, oh my gosh. Theorem 1.3.5. If A and B are events in the sample space, then the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B, right? But then we have to subtract that overlap so minus the probability of A and B. Okay. It makes sense if we think about uh, just in terms of the Venn diagram. Uh, I'll do an A here and I'll do a B here. Okay. So if I use orange for A, now it gets a little bit confusing, but we can actually use these circles for either the event A, but also the probability of A. So we need to be a little bit flexible when we look at these, because when I look at these now that I'm talking about probabilities, then I can say that, okay, well, the probability of A can still be represented by that circle and the probability of B can still be represented by that circle. Right, but then we have to subtract one of the overlaps so that we get this flat surface is how I think about it. Okay, and so here, the probability of A is the orange section. The probability of B I'll have as the green section Right, and then here, this area here is the probability of A and B, right? So we need to subtract one of those overlaps. So we need to subtract one of those overlaps. And so that's where that came from. We didn't have that problem before because they were disjoint, right? There was no shared space. So how are we going to prove this? Okay. So what's tricky is that before we were managing by writing out everything as if they were disjoint uh, unions which is actually where we're gonna start still. So the proof, we, yep. The proof, um, we can start uh, by representing each set as a union of non-intersecting or disjoint sets. Oops. Non-intersecting slash disjoint sets. Okay. In fact, I want you to focus on uh, A or B and B. Okay, so I just, I'm gonna pause the recording and give you just two minutes to see if you can rewrite the area of A or B as a union of disjoint sets. Okay, so I'm gonna give you two minutes and same thing with B. Right. So A or B is any area that's in A or B. And I want you to represent it as a union of disjoint sets. 
right? With no overlap. And then I want you to do the same thing with B, rewrite it as a union of disjoint sets. So I'm gonna pause here and give you just two minutes. How about we'll do A or B together and then I'll give you some time to do B. How about that? Just so you can see what I mean. So if I look at A or B in terms of a Venn diagram, I have A, B, okay. So the total area that I want here is going to be, and I'll do it in yellow, is gonna be this entire space, right? But what I wanna do is I want to break it up so that I can talk about it in terms of a disjoint union, okay? And so, First thought I have is maybe, maybe, just maybe, I focus on just representing this set. This set would be, would be what? This is the set of A, right? And not B. Right? So here, it's the intersection of A and not B. So it has to be in A and it can't be in B. And then what would I have here? I could try this, which would just be B. So option number one, so A or B, we could write it as A and not B or B. What's another way that you could write it? You could do the opposite, right? So or A or B becomes so now I'm gonna focus on the other side, right? Do the same thing that I did earlier, but now I'm just gonna look at everything in B, but not in A, right? And so that would be B and not A. So that would be this half circle here, right? Or A. So there are two ways that we could represent uh, A or B, so the union of A or B, uh, in terms of disjoint unions, right? Notice that these two sets, regardless of which ones I'm talking about, have no overlap, right? So then I'm back to that property that I've been using all along. In fact, uh, what we'll see is that uh, we're going to end up using this version here, the second version, and I'll show you why by having a look at how can you represent B. So now, now rewrite B as a union of two disjoint sets, right? Effectively making it more complicated, but it's gonna take us down that path. So uh, here, it might help to write it out. So B, B is this circle here. So this is when I'm gonna pause it for just two minutes and see what you can get to, right? So rewrite B as a union of two disjoint sets. I'll pause it here, keep going. All right, so if I'm just looking at the set B, right? I see two distinct uh, and disjoint areas. 
right? So what I need to do is probably rewrite this area as a set. What's that area? That's gonna be the set of A and B, right? And so here, that's A and B. And then here, that set, that's gonna be the set of B, right? Because it's all of B, but not A, right? And so B uh, or B and not A. And maybe I should do that one in green. I can't think of a different way of writing uh, writing out B. It could involve, I guess, the sample space, but uh, this feels like the most obvious way to rewrite B as a union of two disjoint sets. So now what I wanna do is we're gonna consider all our options. Right, and so here, I'm just gonna copy paste this down here, uh, but also this one, copy paste. Okay. And maybe what I'll do is I'll change this. Can I? Oh, no. Style. There. Okay, so now, how do I choose which one of these two options do I use? Because I see that I have this here and this, right? These are the same. So those are the ones that I'm going to use because I'm trying to uh, trying to eliminate as many different sets as I can. So now that I have these two sets that appear in both my disjoint unions, then that's the one that I'm going to latch on to. And I recognize that I even uh, helped you out by telling you that, okay, we're going to look at a or B and B specifically. What you would have had to do if you were working through this proof on your own is that you could try to rewrite A or B as a set of disjoint unions, A as a set of disjoint unions, B as a set of disjoint unions. We can't rewrite A and B as a set of disjoint unions because they are the overlap, right? So there is no way to work around that. But that's okay, right? We could have focused on A or B and B, or A or B and A, or even A and B and see what happens. But I'm eliminating a lot of that guesswork. But you're welcome to work through that and try all the different combinations, right? And so uh, here I'll do a little side note. Note, we could have tried could have tried rewriting A as well um, to see if we can simplify anything, to see if we could simplify anything. Right? Also, A and B uh, is an intersection, is an intersection, so we can't rewrite it as a disjoint union. Okay. 
So uh, that one's out of play, but that's okay. So what we end up doing is we latch on to these two because they've got that common, common set. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is now that I have these disjoint unions, now I can rewrite these probabilities uh, in terms of the disjoint unions. So what? let's refresh here. We want to show that the probability of A or B is just the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. So what we can do is from here, oh, and I guess I am doing the proof. We can say that the probability of A or B, oops, is the probability of B and not A plus the probability of A, right? Because they're disjoint. And we can also rewrite B, which was the union of A and B or B and not A. So the probability of B is the probability of A and B or so plus the probability of B and not A. Okay. So now, right, again, noticing that I have this setup, right? So what if I solve each of these for uh, for the probability of B and not A. Right? So solving for the probability of B and not A in each, uh, we find we find that the probability of B and not A, is kind of the, the link between the two. So what I'm gonna do on the left-hand side is I'm gonna have the probability of A or B minus the probability of A, and that's going to equal the probability of B and not A. And on the right-hand side of that, just to show, then I'm gonna solve for this probability of B and not A, which is the same, right? And so now I'm gonna have on the right-hand side, I'm gonna have the probability of B minus the probability of A and B, okay? So in the middle, I'm gonna have the probability of B and not A. And on the left-hand side, I'm gonna have the probability of A or B minus the probability of A, which is the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. If A equals B equals C, then A equals C, right? So here, since A equals B equals C, we know A equals C. Right, is that the transitive property or something like that? I can never remember, but uh, it's a property that's a fact. And so then we can say that A equals C. So what that means in this case is that the probability of A or B minus the probability of A must be equal to the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. rearranging this, right, to get it to look like where we started, which was the probability of A or B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. All we have to do is subtract the probability or add the probability of A and B to both sides. So we get the probability of A or B 
is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B, which is exactly what we were looking for. Hey, I should make a nicer box than that, shouldn't I? That was a big proof. So I'll end it there. Yeah. So a lot of fiddling there, trying to rewrite those uh, now intersecting unions um, as disjoint unions, and then it falls in into place, right? So now that we have that key property, right? And so uh, it's called the general addition rule. Uh, this is called the general addition rule. Mm -hmm. um, and we can use it to develop probabilities for, for different sets now. Okay. And so uh, we can use it to develop probabilities for different sets. Okay. So the first kind of quick example that I wanna show you, or the only quick example that I wanna show you right now is going back to where we rolled two dice Right, and then we recorded which value was, was shown on each dice as an ordered pair, right? We already know that there were 36 possible outcomes. And then uh, I wanna jump from there to talk about counting rules. But let's just go through this, uh, this example here. So consider two dice rolled two dice rolled and the values are recorded right. as an ordered pair, but that's implied. Uh, we let C denote the sample space, denote the sample space, And we recall there were 36 possible outcomes. There were 36 possible outcomes, which kind of sets us on the right path for probabilities, right? The number of possible outcomes over however many, um, or I'd rather uh, dividing into the number of possible outcomes that we're interested in. So anyway, so we recall that there were 36 possible outcomes. We assume that these dice are fair, right? Which means that every possible outcome has the same probability, which means that we can, we can call them Likely, equi meaning the same, right? And likely meaning probability, right? And so we assume, we assume the dice are fair. The dice are fair. So uh, each ordered pair has the same probability. Okay. Uh, we say the outcomes are equilikely, equilikely, right? Same likely, same probability. In fact, they have the probability, the probability 
of each outcome is one in 36, right? Because each outcome is just one out of 36 possible outcomes, but they all have the same probability. And so we can say one in 36. If, let's just, for this example, if we let the set C1 be the set of one, one, two, one, three, one, four, one, and five, one, I think. And the second set C2 be the set of one, two, 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 and three, two. Okay. Then we can find the probability of C1, the probability of C2, the probability of C1 or C2, and the probability of C1 and C2. It doesn't matter which outcomes are included in C1, all we care about is how many of those 36 outcomes we have in here. And so we have one, two, three, four, five ordered pairs in here. And so the probability of being in C1 is five over 36, right? Because there are five outcomes in C1 out of a total of 36. Same thing for C2, but we only have three elements in C2. And so the probability of C2 is three over 36. Is there any overlap here? in C1 and C2, remembering, right, that 2, 1 is different from 1, 2, okay? So these are different uh, elements, and so there is no overlap here. There's no common elements. And so what we can do is knowing that they are disjoint, right, it means that we can just add up those elements. Or if you prefer, you can say, well, if I don't care if it's in C1 or C2, then I can just add these up and find that there are eight total elements here, right? And there are eight elements that are in either C1 or C2. The probability of C1 and C2 has to be the empty set, right? Because we just decided that there's no overlap here. Right. So a couple of different ways that you could arrive at 8 over 36 for the probability of C1 or C2. Uh, I'd say the easiest way is just to add up all the possible elements and divide by 36. Or you could say that um, since C1 and C2 is the empty set, right? Or rather, this should be the probability of the empty set. Dang. So since, sorry about that, I missed the probability of it. Oops. Um, so since there's no overlap, right, then we know that the probability of C1 or C2 is just the probability of C1 plus the probability of C2. Change things completely. Um, right, and so now, if I'm talking about the probability of the empty set, the probability of the empty set is zero. Whew. Okay, good. So I wanna talk about some counting rules. Counting rules are uh, possibly, quite possibly familiar, uh, especially I think in, uh, if you've taken Math 314, 
potentially with Steve, then uh, he would have covered some counting rules. So we're just going to go through it and just uh, solidify some of those content, um, uh, some of those concepts. That's what I wanted to say. So 1.3.1 is called counting rules. Okay, and so we're going to talk about three counting rules. So we will discuss three counting rules. Okay, so I'll, I'll name them here and then we're going to work through each one of them um, one by one. So the first one is, I call it the multiplication rule because it, it helps me. The textbook calls it the M by N rule or the MN rule. Um, so I call it the multiplication rule. That's when we're gonna look at things like license plates, how many possible license plates are there. Um, okay. Let's fly. Um, second thing we're going to talk about is permutations. Now, permutations are kind of the special case of the multiplication rule where we have uh, only unique outcomes, right? So we can only have uh, one letter of the alphabet in a license plate at a time, for example. Hey, this fly just won't get out of here. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about combinations. Now, combinations is talking about how many different um, subsets of size K can I pull from uh, a set of elements with N elements. So combinations. So starting with the multiplication rule, it's a nice place to start. In fact, we've already used it uh, with those dice, right? So the multiplication rule it's also called the MN rule or M by N rule or M times or M times N rule. Okay. So we're going to establish a set uh, with M elements and a set with N elements. And I know that's hard to differentiate, especially when you're just listening. So it helps if I write them down. So if I let let A be the set of X1, X2, all the way up to XM, right? Then I can clarify here and say that uh, A is a set with M elements, right? Oops. Sorry, not curly bracket there. And B, B is going to be very similar, but it's going to be Y1, Y2, all the way up to Yn, which means that B is a set with N elements. Then there are M times N uh, ordered pairs. Then there are M, N, right? So M times N ordered pairs, X, I, Y, I where of course I is from one to up to M and J is from, oh, sorry. 
j is going to n and so j must be on the y's so i'm going to change that make it more obvious should be y j sneaky uh, j is going from one to all the way up to n that's just summarizing from here right so that's how i caught my typo here in fact I should fix it before I forget. I think there. For the dice, right? Go back to the dice example. So in oops, in the dice example. We had uh we had a is the set one, two, three, four, five, six. And B was the set one, two, three, four, five, six. Which means that we have uh, M equals six because there are six outcomes here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, confusing because it's also the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, but it not necessarily, right? And so uh, then we have six possible outcomes. So M equals six and N equals six. So then therefore we have M times N, which is six times six, which is 36 possible uh, ordered pairs as we found earlier. And by earlier here, I mean uh, potentially a few days ago. Okay. But we did see that, right? Because we set it up like this, right? Where I have dice number one and dice number two, and then I can look at all those ordered pairs, but that is a six by six grid, right? And so that's, uh, it's still the same multiplication rule. So just to emphasize what's going on here, we could formulate this if you wanted to, we could formulate this as a spot for dice number one and a spot for dice number two. I guess it's die. Can only die once, one die. One die, two dice, die number two. Right, how I like to play it out is, okay, die number one, there are six possible outcomes. So I have six possible outcomes. And same thing for die number two, I have six possible outcomes. What if I changed it and I said, die number two actually has 10 sides. How many ordered pairs could I have? Well, I could have six times 10 instead, right? So then I'd have 60 ordered pairs, for example, right? And so here uh, we just jot down a uh, number of possible values. in both and we multiply to find that we get six times six is 36. Okay. So now I want you to extend this to think about a license plate. So let's think about an old school, typical license plate three letters followed by three numbers, right? And so, um, and I think even in BC, it used to be three numbers followed by three letters. And then all of a sudden they switched it to be three letters followed by three numbers, which would give you other license plates, right? And now I think they've got a letter, a number, letter, number, letter, number. Right, and so that would give you another um, kind of another bank of possible license plates. So that's why they had to start doing that. So I uh, consider, and maybe 
call this an example, consider um, a license plate with three letters followed by three numbers. How many, how many, um, how many license plate combinations do we have? And I shouldn't say combinations. How many, uh, how many license plates? Can we create? So I'll give you a little bit of a breather to think about it. How I would set it up is I would set it up uh, similar to this, where I have slots for the number of possible outcomes. And then because they're happening together, right? Uh, and so I find myself saying die one and die two. So then I'm multiplying. Whenever I catch myself saying and, I'm multiplying. And so if we set it up like this, we would have a letter, a letter, letter, followed by a number, number, number. All right? So if the first letter is A, right, then I could run through and have AAA000, don't forget about zero, right? How many possible letters are there? There are 26 to choose from, right? And so here I have 26 letters that I could pick from for the first letter. Now I move on to the second letter. There's nothing that says that I can't have repeating, uh, repeating values, right? I could have a license plate that's triple A, 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 A. That's fine, that's allowed, right? So there are no restrictions here in this case, right? I think they have some license plates that they don't allow, right? So um, I'm trying, well, they're not allowed for a reason, right? I, I don't think that there is uh, probably even a triple X, XXX, maybe not. I don't know, maybe it's out there and whoever has it is feels really cool. Um, but so for us here, when we're just starting, there are 26 letters that I could choose from uh, every time. So 26, 26. And then what I want you to remember is that here, we're going to have 10 numbers to choose from, right? Because zero is an option. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? And then once I hit 10, that's too many digits. So then I have 10 to choose from here, still 10 to choose from, right? Because I, ha I could have a, 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 zero, 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 right? There's nothing stopping that. So because these all have to happen together, that's when we end up using the multiplication rule. So we end up just multiplying through here and something makes me think that it's too large probably for my calculator to handle, but I'm just gonna try it. 26 times 26 times 26 times 10 times 10 times 10. Okay, never mind. it can handle it. Let me bump this over. So there are one, seven, five, seven, six, one, two, three, one, two, three possible license plates with that combination. There are obviously some license plates that are pulled out, um, but let me just add in some. So there are 17,576,000 uh, different license plates with that combination. Right, it's a lot of cars to go through. Um, so you can imagine, so they had to run through this many license plates before they had to switch it, right? Because then they switched it in BC, especially they switched it. I can't remember which one was which, but 
uh, which one was first, but I think they switched it so that at first it was number, 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 letter, 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 right? Which would give you the same number of combinations, right? Because uh, the order wouldn't change the multiplication, right? But those plates would be unique from letter, 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 number, 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 right? So now if we multiply that by two, we'd be at 35 million cars. And then they had to change the setup again, right? And so uh, that's a lot of cars, crazy. Um, okay, so this is how many license plates that we could create with this setup. So we could play around with that. The next, and I think I had the numberings, yeah. Next thing I wanna introduce kind of before we go here is permutations. Permutations, for me at least, uh, are the hardest for, for me to wrap my brain around uh, because so permutations are unique in the sense that we can only have distinct values. So there's no, uh, no overlap. So for example, a permutation here would be, okay, I've chosen, I have 26 choices from the first letter, but then that means I can't repeat that letter, right? So now there's no repetition, which means that I have only 25 to choose from for the, for the next letter. And then I only have 24 to choose from for the, for the third letter because I can't have any repetition. So permutations uh, do not allow repetition. Okay. And what we say is we call it a K tuple. K tuple is really just a, um, a holding place for this set of three letters would be a three tuple. Okay, so it has one, two, three of the same thing. And if we want a three tuple with distinct elements, then we would have a permutation, right? A three tuple. Because these are talking about two different things, letters and numbers, I wouldn't call it a six tuple because it's a three tuple and a three tuple. Okay, but that's the idea. So you could have a six tuple and that would be six letters in a row. But if you need them to all be unique, then, um, then you have a permutation. So uh, permutations do not allow repetition and uh, a permutation is a K tuple. So I do this kind of script K, um, because it's kind of a placeholder, it's kind of a variable. So it's a K tuple whose components are distinct, which means we have no repeats. Okay. So, Let's start talking about just general K tuples, right? And so in general, uh, if we want to talk about K tuples, not necessarily uh, distinct, right? And so here, K tuples, uh, not distinct. We'll start there. If we let A be a set with L, L, or sorry, be a set with N, lowercase n elements. I don't know where I got L from. Uh, elements. We're interested in K tuples who are components of the elements of A. So what that means is if I want a four tuple of letters, Right, then I would have a series of four letters, right? So uh, 
we are interested in k tuples whose components whose components are elements of a so that is if we let k be 4 right so then we're making a 4 tuple then there are then there are n times n times n times n which is n to the power of 4 possible four tuples. And how I like to think about it is, right, it's the same thing. Outcome one, outcome two, outcome three, outcome four, each of which have n possible outcomes. Remember, this is where we don't have any distinct elements or distinct elements in the tuple. Okay. And I guess I'm out of time, but we'll keep talking about uh, permutations. Um, I guess we've got the lab tomorrow. Dang it. I wanted to talk about permutations. So maybe I'll wrap up permutations in the lab tomorrow and I'll show you uh, the birthday problem, which again, if you've had a class with Steve, he likes to use the birthday problem. Uh, and we're going to dig into it a little bit more. So uh, I'll end it there for today and I'll see you guys tomorrow. And it, let me know if you have any questions, but I'm going to end this recording.